chair, but you know, Shuki's gone. So I am going to have to step in and introduce uh, 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 Peter Bergen, who you probably all seen on television. Um, <clears throat> is really one, as I indicated in the notice, is uh, uh, one of the leading journalists in, uh, in the country and has been at the, uh, um, at the forefront of covering both bin Laden and Al Qaeda and all the developments in terrorism for, for the last 10, 15 years. And, and I say 50, really going back to the mid 90s. So he's been there well before 9 uh, <clears> 11, <throat> uh, well uh, uh, and then what, 97? Yeah, 97. We described it in the book, but 97 and this uh, uh, interviewed was the only American journalist to, to interview Bin Laden uh, in an amazing um, uh, story that he describes. Um, and he has uh, written a number of things. His the book that he's going to talk about today is uh, Manhunt, uh, The Search for Bin Laden. And uh, we, as usual, have it for sale up there. Uh, and so everybody can buy a copy and then in the reception. Get him, to, get him to sign it. I always like to say authors, I'm sh uh, it's one of the great narcissistic pleasures of writing a book, <laughs> to be able to sign copies that people buy uh, who then hear your lecture. So, uh, Peter? Thank you. thank you very much, Professor Schroeser, and thank you for the uh, invitation, and thanks for coming today. And, uh, you know, Kindle doesn't allow you to sign That's books, correct. unfortunately. Uh, but eventually they'll come up with a feature that, that will let you do that. So. Yeah, this book, Manhunt, was the fourth book that I wrote about Al Qaeda, and <clears throat> I've been, uh, as as Chuck indicated, um, been writing or thinking about Bin Laden and Al Qaeda for a long time before I wrote the book, and so I was able, I think, to distill quite a lot of um, thinking into one relatively short volume, which I began writing um, the day after Bin Laden <coughs> was killed, and uh, I had a pretty tight deadline, uh, which is actually a good thing because. I tend to blow deadlines, and uh, I think deadlines are uh, useful. Um, they brought us an energy to the writing of the book uh, because I had about 10 months to report and write and research and uh, edit. Um, and so this is the first book I've ever sat down in a very self-conscious way instead of just sort of writing and writing and writing and hoping that it will come out uh, at the end okay. Can't sort of have, have a much better. I had a much better plan going in to write this book, and the plan basically, I, I thought I needed to answer five or six big questions, which were: one, um, what was Bin Laden doing after 9/11, and as a subset of that, to what extent was he controlling Al Qaeda, and as a subset of that, how was Al Qaeda doing in general? Two, um, what was the the CIA story of finding bin Laden, which is really an Agatha Christie story of how they did that. Interestingly, uh, and appropriately for an Agatha Christie story, uh, many of the people involved in that, in that hunt were women uh, at the agency. Uh, third, the sort of evolution of Joint Special Operations Command, which did the operation, and which is a very different animal today than it would have been um, in the 90s. And one of the reasons that President Obama uh, basically was pretty comfortable with authorizing the mission was he had very little w he had very little to reason to worry that the mission would fail militarily. There were a lot of other things he had to worry about uh, politically about the mission, but uh, militarily uh, as, an, as an operation that could be pulled off by this group of men, uh, he did not uh, have to worry himself too much. And as you know, there were still problems with the mission. Um, and Another uh, sort of thing I had to deal with to some degree was the U.S.-Pakistan relationship, which was uh, at an all-time low during this uh, uh, operation. And, um, and then, of course, I had to deal with the decision-making process uh, in the White House and President Obama as a decision-maker, and also President Obama, parenthetically, as a commander-in-chief. And this is a lot clearer now than it would have been when I started writing, I think. But you know, this is one of the most aggressive, uh, militarily aggressive presidents uh, of the post-World War II era, which I think um, was pretty surprising for a lot of people who voted for him uh, in 2000 uh, and, and eight, uh, because he's not the president, I think, that they thought that they were voting for. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that I did in the book was to go back and look at some of his key speeches uh, 
uh, before he was elected president and shortly after he was elected president as a clue to trying to understand him as a commander in chief. And um, he was very explicit about um, his views about the use of force in two uh, key speeches that I went back to for the book. One was a speech he gave on August the 1st, uh, 2007, I believe was the date, at the Woodrow Wilson Center in, um, in Washington, D.C. And this was his big keynote foreign policy speech because, of course, the presumptive Democratic candidate was Hillary Clinton, who was regarded as having uh, foreign policy credentials by virtue of the fact that she was first lady for eight years. She was also on the Senate Armed Services Committee. And the presumptive uh, Republican candidate was John McCain, who, of course, had been on the Senate Armed Services Committee for 30 years and was also seen as somebody with real national security credentials. And uh, the speech w which he gave at Woodrow Wilson was written uh, with Lee Hamilton, who ran the Woodrow Wilson Center at that time, who had been the chairman of the House Foreign Relations Committee for many years. Uh, ben Rhodes, who would then go on to become the deputy national security advisor for strategic communications. Susan Rice, who of course is the national security advisor now. And Dennis McDonough, who's now the chief of staff. <coughs> and they basically, um, they knew that this speech was a key speech to explain uh, who President Obama was, or potentially President Obama was on foreign policy. Um, and they labored over one particular line in the speech at some length, and that was a line which essentially said that in, if, if, we, if it was clear that the Pakistanis uh, uh, were not going to go after some high-value target in Pakistan and that the United States knew about the presence of this person, that uh, the United States would reserve the right to go into Pakistan unilaterally to capture or kill this target. Um, and this, you may recall, produced a chorus of condemnation from all sides, from both the Democrats and the Republicans, when this particular part of the speech was reported. Um, Governor Mitt Romney, who was a Republican candidate for president at the time, uh, described Pre uh, Barack Obama as a Dr. Strangelove. Uh, Christopher Dodd, who was also a candidate for president, uh, said something equally disparaging. Hillary Clinton was, said something disparaging. John McCain said something disparaging about, you know, this is a guy who's going to attack our allies, etc. But from the very beginning, uh, Barack Obama said that he was willing to take unilateral action against al-Qaeda in a country that was normally an ally of the United States. Fast forward a, f a couple of years, and I looked at President Obama's uh, Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech in Oslo, uh, very early on in his presidency, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And he must have been the first person in history to go and accept the Nobel Peace Prize and outline his philosophy of war uh, during his acceptance speech. And basically, he, he said, you know, much as I admire him, I think it's one of the best speeches. I'm sure he wrote it uh, largely himself. It's, it's a very well-written speech, and I'm, not, I'm paraphrasing it rather than quoting from it. He said, much as I admire Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King, um, Nonviolence wouldn't have stop, stopped the Nazis, and nonviolence is uh, unlikely to stop Al Qaeda, and it's not a group you can negotiate with. And, and essentially, it was a sort of uh, an outline of his theory of just wars. Um, and so, when you took, take these two speeches together, uh, in a sense, the decision that he ultimately made, and in fact, his whole drone campaign, is a lot less surprising than people might have uh, considered it initially. Uh, it's. Um, and I, I, I don't have a really good answer for why he uh, is very comfortable with the use of American power. Uh, but I will make the observation that he's the first major American political figure <coughs> for a very long time who what he did or did not do in Vietnam is not part of his story. So, uh, you know, unlike Dick Cheney, you took five, five deferments, or uh, George W. Bush, who was in the Texas National Guard, or John McCain, who, of course, spent five years in prison in Vietnam, or Bill Clinton, who basically got, uh, you know, was was at the University of Oxford uh, for during during the time he might have served in Vietnam, or or John Kerry, who of course did serve in Vietnam. It's be, it's that the Vietnam experience has been a huge part of all these political stories, and it's just not it's just completely absent in Barack Obama's story because he was too young to either serve or not serve, um, and in a way he's not haunted by by that, that you know the experience of Vietnam. <coughs> Um, and I, I don't know if that's a good answer to why he's very comfortable with use of American power, uh, but I think it may be an answer. So President Obama as a decision maker uh, was some, certainly something I needed to deal with in the book. Uh, 
um, and I'll get into the actual decisions in a, in, a, in a little bit. But before we get there, let me first of all paint a picture of what Osama bin Laden was doing after 9-11, and we have pretty good detail on that, and then uh, explain the Agatha Christie story about how he was found, um, and a little bit of the, uh, the military story behind the Joint Special Operations Command. So after 9-11, as you know, uh, Osama bin Laden fled uh, ultimately to the to Tora Bora in eastern Afghanistan, which is an area which is uh, mountains that rise to 14,000 feet and is a, a very good place to disappear. Um, there are multiple exit routes into Pakistan. Uh, there was a battle there <coughs> basically from about December 3rd to December 14th, 2001. And you may recall in the 2004 campaign, John Kerry made a big issue of the fact that the Bush administration uh, essentially let bin Laden go at the Battle of Tara Bora, not, wit not wittingly, but de facto. And um, Tommy Franks, who was in charge of the operation there, uh, he was the head of CENTCOM, actually wrote an editorial in the New York Times saying that Kerry was wrong, that the, uh, that the intelligence that bin Laden was at Tara Bora was sketchy and he could have been a lot of other places. That was all total nonsense, by the way. Um, during the battle, there were multiple uh, multiple interceptions of bin Laden's voice on the radio by people on the ground who recognized his voice, who'd been tracking him. Um, there, were, there was a request from the CIA officers on the ground for a battalion of rangers to be put in, 800 men. Uh, that re request was turned down by Tommy Franks, and I was able actually to have an email exchange with him about what, what his reasoning was, why he turned down that request. And, he had, and it's in the book, uh, basically he had a whole laundry list of regions, reasons, including we didn't know if bin Laden was there, uh, we didn't want to repeat the mistakes of the Soviets. It would have taken a long time. And all of, all of these, by the way, are, are, I think are, are false in one way or another. Um, you could have, I've actually talked to General, St General Stanley McChrystal about this issue uh, after the book came out, who was at the time the head of the 82nd Airborne at Fort Bragg. Uh, he said, look, we could have put a battalion of rangers in there within a week. Now, would bin Laden have been caught? I don't know. Um, you know, it was, <coughs> it was in the middle of winter. This is a very difficult terrain. Uh, but the, I, one factoid speaks for itself. There were more journalists at the Battle of Tora Bora than American soldiers. So, um, <laughs> you know, I can say that with a great deal of precision because uh, there were about 70 U.S. Special Forces at the battle uh, and, uh, you know, maybe a handful of CIA officers, a dozen British Special Boat Service officers, um, and there were at least 100 journalists at the ha height of the battle. So if Fox and CNN and the Washington Post and every other news organization could manage to get their teams there, um, you know, it, 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 it certainly raises a question about why the United States couldn't get a uh, greater force there. So anyway, um, bin Laden disappeared from the Battle of Tarabar, and we now know that he did something very clever, which is instead of going into Pakistan, which is where you expect him to go, he doubled back into eastern Afghanistan to an area called Kunar, which is very mountainous and heavily wooded, and he spent a few months there. Then he moved to Peshawar in Pakistan, uh, which is a city of several million people on the border in 2002. And I can say all this with a great deal of certainty because uh, after the paperback edition of my book came out, no, in fact, before this, before this edition came out, um, a uh, Islamabad police report summarizing the interrogation of one of his wives uh, became public. Um, and that really reconstructs exactly what bin Laden was doing for the, for the nine years he was in Pakistan. So he lived in Peshawar for two th in 2002. Um, he then moved north into Swat, uh, which is where the Pakistani Taliban um, you know, staged quite a renaissance in 2009. Uh, he was in a number of cities around, that, around the Swat region, um, and eventually he got to Abtabad, uh, which is... <coughs> in central northern Pakistan, he arrived there in the summer of 2005. Um, during that period, bin Laden had four kids. Um, most fugitives don't have multiple children when they're on the run, uh, certainly not the world's most wanted man. He, had, uh, he was with his wives, two of them. His third wife joined in 2010. Uh, the wives are kind of unexpected. One, is a, one was a 63-year-old 63, 63 uh, Saudi PhD, uh, PhD in Quranic the theology. Uh, the second was a 53-year-old, with, again with a PhD, a Saudi. Uh, these were highly educated women. They basically married bin Laden knowing that in their own minds he was a jihadi war hero. And the, f and the youngest wife was a Yemeni who didn't graduate from high school. Uh, she's the one that he had the four kids with while he was on the run. Um, and these were, these, 
these, these were with him. So uh, when he was on the run, uh, he had most, uh, for a good chunk of the time, he had a dozen kids and grandkids with him and, th and three wives. Um, he arrives in Abtabad, and uh, he lives there, and I was the only outside observer to, be, uh, to get into the compound before it was uh, demolished by the Pakistanis. Uh, and I, I didn't know it was going to be demolished uh, two weeks after I visited, but uh, it did allow me to get a pretty good sense of, um, of um, how bin Laden was living. And he was not living, uh, it, you know, it was, it was a pretty rudimentary uh, life. They were, um, it w the, the, the compound probably cost a couple hundred thousand dollars to build. Uh, it was, certainly wasn't a million dollar mansion as it was initially portrayed. Um, they were growing their own crops. They were self-sufficient. Uh, they had their own cows, cattle, chickens, honeybees, uh, vegetables. Um, they didn't really have to go uh, out much, uh, which of course was good for security. Um, there were three families living on the compound, the two bodyguards who were also the couriers and their wives and kids, and bin Laden's uh, wives and kids. The compound extended over about an acre. Um, there was very little, there was no air conditioning for a place that got hot in the summer. Uh, very little heating. I looked at. I was able to examine the um, gas and electricity bills. They were spending, you know, 25 bucks a month on on gas and electricity. Uh, they were sleeping on uh, beds that were like almost made of this kind of material. That was very, or actually much worse. It was basically sort of like bits of uh, wood sort of hammered together. Um, and so it was a, you know, uh, it was a Spartan existence. On the other hand, for the world's most wanted man. Uh, it wasn't a bad situation. He was surrounded by his wives and kids. He was able to, uh, the couriers were bringing him stuff. They were printing off the internet. He was spending a lot of time writing very lengthy memos to Al-Qaeda members. And this gets to what the extent to which he was in control of the organization. He was writing, um, he was communicating with Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. He, he said Anwar al laki the Yemeni American, uh, should not become the leader of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. He was comfortable with the leadership that existed. He was sending notes to Al-Shabaab in Somalia. Now, it's not clear if they ever got through, but he was certainly composing these. Uh, he said to Al-Shabaab in Somalia, don't rename yourself Al-Qaeda. It'll be bad for fundraising. It's going to attract a lot of negative attention. And by the way, stop attacking civilians in the middle of Mogadishu. And there was a lot of discussion within Al-Qaeda about how damaging Al-Qaeda in Iraq had been to them with, its camp with their campaign against Muslim civilians and how Al-Qaeda, the brand, had been very damaged. Uh, a lot of discussion about how they were running out of money a great deal of discussion about how damaging the CIA drone program was to their leadership. And bin Laden, in these memos that he was writing, I think showed a pretty good understanding of how badly damaged his organization was. Uh, his self-assessment of where they were was, would match with, I think, any reasonable person's assessment of where Al-Qaeda was at the time. And he, uh, he had, was blue-skying about you know, killing President Obama and killing General Petraeus for the 10th anniversary of 9-11, but these were clearly not serious plots. Uh, he had a lot of time on his hands uh, to write these memos. One of them it runs to 46 pages. Now, of course, you can read them all on West Point's uh, um, counterterrorism site. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the picture of where bin Laden was living, how he was living. Uh, so then let's switch focus to the question of how CIA found him. Um, and that is a quite involved story. Um, and there was no, there was a realization at the CIA from 2003, 2004 that there was going to be no detainee who knew where Bin Laden was. There was going to be no detainee who was going to give them any really substantial help on that issue, even if they were waterboarded. Uh, there was going to be no detainee who, there was going to be no magic bullet. And that they basically needed to get back to kind of first principles to think about how how to find bin Laden. It was going to, uh, and so um, there's a female analyst in the book, I, I name her, I think, Renee, who wrote a book, and uh, wrote a, uh, a memo in 2005 saying, um, it was entitled Pillars, and she said, on you know, we, should, we should basically look at all the intelligence we've collected already, and, 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 and we should look forward at any intelligence we gather in the future, and we should filter it through four basic pillars on which we shall place the bin Laden hunt. And one was communication, we might be able to find bin Laden through communication with the media. Uh, clearly, bin Laden was communicating with the media. We released 30 video and audio tapes at least after 9-11. Many of them went to Al Jazeera. They are physical products that had to be taken to Al Jazeera, to its bureau in Islamabad, or its headquarters in Qatar. Uh, 
uh, and Al Jazeera wasn't the only organization getting videotapes and audio tapes. They also went to other uh, networks. So could you trace back the chain of custody of these, of these tapes? Uh, was one question. The second uh, possible method was to, um, it, was there any way to intercept uh, communications between bin Laden and his immediate family? Was there any way to gather information between bin Laden and other leaders of Al-Qaeda? And was there any way to kind of just get inside the courier network that was clearly getting bin Laden's messages to various people? And it turned out that they could never intercept any messages going to Al Jazeera or any other me media organization, or they, if they did intercept them, they could never tr trace the chain of custody past a certain number of cutouts along the way. Uh, bin Laden's immediate family was with him, so he had no need to communicate with them, with, or at least some of his immediate family was always with him, so he didn't need to, you know, he was just talking to them, and he wasn't communicating with the other family members in Saudi Arabia at all. Uh, he was, they never intercepted anything that led them uh, to bin Laden through the other leadership uh, communications, so it, le it left them with the courier network, and this is where the story becomes more complicated because the question was who was the courier, and that took, uh, and, and when I tell you what the, the process is, uh, there are gaps in the story that I don't know the answer to, and I'm sure we'll find out more over time. The beginning of the story begins with this guy, um, Ahmed al-Kuwaiti, uh, which is, he, uh, he would turn out to be the courier. Now, how was Ahmed al-Kuwaiti identified? Uh, it's a story that begins nine years before bin Laden is killed. A, the, the real 20th hijacker wasn't Zakiris Masawi in Minnesota, uh, who was uh, uh, practicing uh, flying uh, planes and was uh, detained because of his suspicious behavior at a flight school before 9-11. The, the real 20th hijacker was a guy called Mohammed al Qatani, who was um, arrested in Orlando. No, sorry, he wasn't arrested. He, was, he arrived at Orlando Airport in the summer of 2001. Waiting for him in the parking lot was Mohammed Atta, the leader of the hijackers. And uh, a, a, an immigration officer w didn't buy Mohammed al Qatani's explanation for why he was in the United States. He b barely spoke English. He had, was on a one-way one, one ticket. Uh, he didn't have any good explanation about what he was planning to do. Um, and uh, the, uh, the uh, immigration officer sent him back to his native Saudi Arabia. From there, he went to Afghanistan. Uh, he was in, at the Battle of Tora Bora. He fled into Pakistan. He was arrested in late December of 2001. And uh, he was sent to Guantanamo. In Guantanamo, he said that he was in Afghanistan because of his pressing interest in falconry, uh, which of course wasn't true. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he then, um, at a certain point in the summer of 2002, he hit the fingerprints of the guy who'd been uh, sent back from Orlando Airport and the guy who claimed he was in, interested in falconry turned out to be the same person. So he then became the subject of a great deal of uh, uh, law enforcement and, and other uh, uh, interest at Guantanamo, and he was subjected to a course of uh, coercive interrogations that, uh, in the words of Susan Crawford, who was a federal judge appointed by Ronald Reagan and then became the head of uh, the commissions at, uh, at, at Guantanamo under George W. Bush at that time, she said that his treatment amounted to torture and he could never be tried for anything, and in fact he won't be. Um, so what happened to him in the, f in the days that he was coercively interrogated? He, uh, he was basically kept up for about 40 plus days. And all of this is detailed in, a, in the Time Magazine piece, which uh, they got hold of his interrogation logs. Um, he was kept up for 40 days at least. Um, he uh, was subjected to uh, extremes of hot and cold. He was forced to perform dog tricks. He had sometimes uh, stripped naked in the presence of females. He, uh, if he was falling asleep, he was given uh, loud doses of particularly annoying tracks by Christina Aguilera. He was uh, basically, uh, you know, he was, he was, um, anyway, so he was uh, definitely coercively interrogated. Now, he was, he, it's now, this is not clear what, when, when this happened. And according to a 6,000 page report, which the Senate Intelligence Committee is sitting on, still hasn't been declassified in any shape or form. Um, you know, we, we may have better answers when this report comes out in an unclassified form, but either before, during, or after this, he said that the person who was kind of teaching him about uh, security within Al-Qaeda uh, was a guy called Ahmed al-Kuwaiti, and that this guy was clearly part of the inner circle of Al-Qaeda. Now, Ahmed al-Kuwaiti is not a particularly useful clue because it means the father of Ahmed from Kuwait, and there are millions of Kuwaitis, many of them have kids called Ahmed. However, it was the beginning of what would eventually lead to the courier. So fast forward to, actually in 2004, 
a guy called Hassan Ghul, who's an al-Qaeda courier sent from bin Laden to the leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq, Abu Musab al-Zakawi, basically telling him to kind of stop his campaign against uh, Iraqi civilians uh, and, and Shia in particular, is picked up uh, in Kurdistan and according to a CIA officer who, uh, who was in charge of the hunt for Zakawi, during his time in Kurdish custody, he said that this guy Ahmed, Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti not only was important in al-Qaeda, but was one of bin Laden's couriers. Fast forward another three years to 2007, uh, somehow the United States found out that Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti's real name was Ibrahim Saeed. Now, Ibrahim Saeed wasn't a Kuwaiti, he was actually a Pakistani, complicating things. Uh, it was, he was a Pakistani who grew up in Kuwait, just like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Now, if you're, if you're a Pakistani living in Kuwait, Kuwait will never give you citizenship. So these were second generation Pakistanis who had grown up in Kuwait, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the operational commander of 9-11, and this guy Ahmed, Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti. And they knew each other. Um, and they were part of the sort of inner circle of al-Qaeda. Ibrahim Saeed, uh, a Pakistani, uh, sort of a John Smith name in, in Pakistan, a country of almost 200 million people. But we're beginning to have the point where we now have a real name with the actual country where he's from. But there's no sense that this is going to, this is, this is the, this is Bin Laden's, this is Bin Laden's courier. There's a sense that this guy is maybe Bin Laden, a courier of Bin Laden, maybe important. Sometime in the summer of 2010, probably with, a, with the help of the Pakistanis, uh, perhaps inadvertent help, uh, a phone call from somebody that they believe to be the courier uh, takes place to somebody in the Gulf who they're tracking, who they believe to be at least perhaps part of Al Qaeda. The content of the conversation leads them to believe that the courier, whether we call him Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti al or Ibrahim Saeed, his real name, is still part of al-Qaeda, and he's living in, or he's making phone calls from Peshawar, Pakistan. That's still a very long way from finding him in Abdabad because Peshawar is two and a half drive, hours drive from Abdabad, and he turns his phone off. Not only turns his phone off, uh, he also takes the battery out at least an hour away from where he lives. So you can't track a phone with the battery taken out, even if you're the NSA. Um, and uh, so that requires basically putting people into Peshawar to track this guy when he is making phone calls in Peshawar and either put a tracking device on his vehicle or physically follow him back to his, to his house in Abdabad where he's living, which happens in the summer of 2010. The house that, that the, the courier is living in is interesting because it doesn't have internet or phone service. The people there are burning their trash. They're also lying to their neighbors about who they are. Uh, they're, all, in fact, even lying to their own family members about who they are, about what they're doing and where they're living. Um, and there is three families living in this house, one family taking exceptional efforts to avoid going out or being surveyed in any way. At that point, Liam Panetta, the CIA director, goes to Barack Obama in August of 2010 basically tells him, we have a very good lead on this house that suggests bin Laden could be there. There are no high fives in the Oval Office and there's probably a group of maybe five or six people who know at this point in the, in the White House. Um, Tom Donilon, Dennis McDonough, the Vice President, the Vice President's National Security Advisor, Tony Blinken, uh, John Brennan, uh, the President's uh, uh, counterterrorism advisor, and that's really it uh, at the beginning. Tom Donilon has said there's a, one way to keep a secret in Washington, don't tell anybody. Um, and that, of course, is true. Uh, and they were very, very careful about, uh, about uh, any kind of, uh, they were very, very careful with this information. And there were some people in the White House who noticed there were meetings that were happening. They're, called, they're actually called non-meetings, uh, where, where which meetings where you don't bring there are no read-ahead papers, you can't bring a second, uh, the uh, cameras in the Situation Room are turned off, and there were a number of these non-meetings that began happening uh, with greater frequency over time. And in these meetings, uh, there was a discussion about the intelligence, the quality of the intelligence, uh, about whether bin Laden was there. And, uh, you know, there was a range of, uh, there was, you know, it was a circumstantial case that bin Laden was living there where they never got a picture of bin Laden, they never got a satellite image, they never, there was nobody who was said, there was no cook who worked at the house who said, I just saw, you know, a six foot four Arab guy looking a lot like bin Laden. There was nothing like that. Um, and Panetta was quite frustrated and kept pushing for better information. 
Uh, at one point, he said, um, well, if we can't get a picture of bin Laden, maybe we can get a picture, we can measure his shadow and get a sense of how tall he is, since we know he's six foot four. So the National Geospatial Imagery measured his shadow and came back and said it's a man between five foot three and six foot eight. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, Jeremy Bash, who was Blina Panetta's chief of staff, went to the bin Laden unit and said, you know, the boss really wants you to be creative here and come up with 25 ideas, they can be as crazy as you want, that show that you are thinking creatively about how we can get better information or a photograph or something out of this house. So they came up with, I think, 38 ideas, some of which are clearly, um, you know, were, 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 were fanciful, one of which was to throw stink bombs into the compound and flush people out. Another one was to broadcast in Arabic the voice of Allah commanding uh, the inhabitants of the, of the compound to leave. Um, and then another one which did happen, which was both creative and ethically dubious, which was the mount of vaccination campaign in, in Abtabad, which would bas basically recruit a Pakistani doctor, have a hepatitis B vaccination campaign be conducted. Uh, the doctor was recruited, he got some nurses, he began the campaign in a poor part of town so it wouldn't arouse any suspicion. And the idea was that they would get into the Bin Laden neighborhood, which was more of a middle class, upper middle class neighborhood get DNA from one of the kids, match it to existing DNA of the Bin Laden family in the United States, and you know, bingo, but that never happened. And of course, this was a very dumb idea in Pakistan because in Pakistan, as you know, it's one of the very few countries where polio uh, is not, has not been eradicated and polio workers are regarded as agents of the CIA by elements of the Taliban. And this program, I think, has certainly endangered um, health workers in Pakistan because it seems to confirm uh, a Pakistani conspiracy theory uh, that vaccination programs are conducted by the CIA, because in this case it was. Um, so none of this really amounted to much in terms of trying to get better intelligence. Um, the CIA was basically faced with a catch-22, which was the way to get better intelligence was to take more, to be more visible on the target, to you know do more obvious surveillance, more people knocking on the door, and basically that might have spooked the target, which they didn't want, did not want to do. And so um, the circumstantial case, they, uh, you know, the, hanging over this all was the, uh, the weapons of mass destruction fiasco in Iraq, which was a circumstantial mm -hmm. case that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. And uh, since then, the agency has been more careful about, uh, has a whole sort of set of protocols to come up with alternative explanations of the same set of information. So when people looked at the evidence for bin Laden living in this compound, they also came up with alternative explanations. Could this be somebody in Al-Qaeda who was retired? Could this be another person in Al-Qaeda? Could this be a drug dealer that re recruited a member of Al-Qaeda to act as a courier? Could this be bin Laden's family without him? The list was fairly long for alternative explanations. Uh, and at a certain point, Mike Morrell, the deputy director of the CIA, briefed uh, President Obama and kind of told him everything I've just told you, essentially. And uh, Obama said, look, why, you know, why are you at 60% probability that bin Laden is in this compound and others, other of your analysts are at 80%? Um, and Morrell said, look, I lived through the uh, Iraq weapons of mass destruction fiasco. I'm uh, very leery, as are many people uh, who live through that, of a circumstantial case. And in fact, Mr. President, um, the circumstantial case that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction is a better circumstantial case than bin Laden living in this compound. So uh, that is a pretty... Um, if I was the president, uh, that would give me a great deal of pause. Um, and you know, this is an, I think this will be, uh, just as President Kennedy's decisions in the Cuban Missile Crisis is kind of a, kind of a case study of presidential decision making coming in a very difficult situation, coming up with the, uh, the best possible solution. I think that people, historians, will look back on this very similarly because um, you're making decisions uh, based on imperfect information. Um, and it's very easy for an analyst to say there's a 40% chance of bin Laden's in, in, in Abtabad or at 80%. But when you make the decision, he's either 100% not there or he's 100% there. Uh, there's no 40% chance that he's there. Uh, and you have to, at the end of the day, you have to make a decision. Uh, and in our system, you make the decision alone. And five days after my book first came out, uh, Mitt Romney said that any president, including Jimmy Carter, would have made this decision. And I didn't know when I was writing the book that that would be one of the responses that people would have to this issue. Um, and, you know, President Carter did make a form of this decision. It, made, it, it substantially contributed to the fact that he was a one-term president. 
and hanging over all the, all the discussions in the National Security Council meetings was a Democratic president who'd authorized a risky special operations uh, operation on the other side of the world in a country that wasn't, uh, that was inimical to American interests and that had contributed to basically his one-term presidency. And every time uh, there was a meeting, uh, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, who had started working for the Nixon White House when President Obama was 12, would make the following point. Uh, that I was in the White House that night that that operation went down. He was the executive assistant to CIA Director Stansfield Turner, a 41-year-old CIA officer. Uh, as you know, everything that could go wrong with this, this operation did go wrong. Uh, the helicopter, helicopters and AC-130s crashed. Seven American servicemen died. Uh, it was a huge fiasco. And it was, by the way, an entirely predictable fiasco because each of the elements of the armed services wanted to be involved in this big, important operation, the Marines, the Army, the Air Force, um, and uh, they had never rehearsed this kind of operation together. I sat next to uh, 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 then Vice President Her Hubert Humphrey uh, recently at a, a, a lunch in Minneapolis, and I was asking him about this operation. He said one of the big problems about the operation, it was all, everything was so top secret that a lot of people involved didn't really understand how the operation all fit together. And the reason I mention all this is Joint, Joint Special Operations Command, which is the, op the command that did the bin Laden raid, came out of that fiasco in the Iranian desert in 1980. There was a realization you couldn't do these operations unless there was, uh, you know, people continuously practiced together and, 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 and understood how, 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 how each other worked. So Joint Special Operations Command was founded uh, coming out of the defeat uh, of the, the disaster of Operation Desert Storm, uh, Desert One, Operation Eagle Claw, sometimes it's referred to. And it was Joint Special Operations Command that did the, uh, the bin Laden raid. Now, the evolution of JSOC, as it's referred to, is an interesting story because this was, uh, JSOC was really a counter-terrorist organization but was never deployed before 9-11 to go after bin Laden or Al-Qaeda, and why was that? Well, you know, paradoxically, uh, or maybe not paradoxically, the Pentagon was extremely re reluctant to authorize any kind of mission uh, in Afghanistan. Um, you know, uh, Steve Cole, my friend and colleague, uh, is in, in his book Ghost Wars, quotes President Clinton basically saying, you know, wouldn't it scare Al-Qaeda if the Black Ninjas sort of came down in their camps and sort of did their thing? Um, and what happened with the conventional army was very suspicious of special operations forces, particularly in the wake of, wake of the Battle of Mogadishu, where 18 American servicemen were killed in 1993. And every time an operation was sort of suggested of this kind, they would basically uh, keep heaving, you know, heaving it up, meaning suggesting more and more p people involved. So politically, it became untenable. Suddenly, it looked like the invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, when it really needed to be a small team to go in and basically take out uh, bin Laden before 9-11. Uh, anyway, suffice it to say that never happened. So Joint Special Operations Command, ironically, which was essentially a counterterrorism force, was never used before 9-11. And uh, it really became, uh, it sort of came to its uh, kind of potential during the Iraq War. Uh, General Stanley McChrystal turned that organization into... He's, uh, I quote him in the book saying, basically, you know, I, w I needed to turn a bookstore into Amazon. And, and what he meant by that was to, instead of uh, an organization that did maybe one or two operations a month, suddenly it was doing 300 operations a month. And so, ben, so uh, President Obama was very comfortable with the abilities of joint special operations. One of the very first decisions he made in office was the, the decision to authorize deadly force in the case of Captain Richard Phillips in Somalia, uh, the subject of the Tom Hanks film. And, you know, this was a flawless military operation. To, uh, after President Obama authorized the use of deadly force, um, Captain Phillips was on the boat for five days. There was a moment where his life seemed to be in danger. Three Navy SEALs, sh at, at a di as, as night fell, at a distance of 30 yards in heaving, in heaving seas, shot each of these three pirates with one shot each. So, kind of a spectacular military uh, feat uh, that surely would have impressed President Obama and certainly impressed uh, him uh, about the abilities of Admiral Bill McRaven, the head of JSOC, who was the architect of the bin Laden operation. So the, the military component was not something that President Obama had to worry over, overly much about. The same night that the bin Laden raid went down, there were 12 other operations in Afghanistan uh, with Joint Special Operations Command, that would, some of which would have been technically more difficult. But he did have to worry about a lot of other things. 
And uh, the big thing, of course, he had to worry about was the reaction of the Pakistanis. Um, as the intelligence picture didn't really improve, um, there came a point where you have to say, what are we going to do about it? We know the intelligence isn't going to improve, so how do we, what are we going to do, if anything? And it really came down to five choices, one of which was, let's do a joint operation with the Pakistanis. Now, that had happened in the past. The arrest of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the operational commander of 9-11, was a joint U.S.-Pakistan relations uh, 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 um, uh, operation. But relations between the two countries were at that nadir. Uh, you may recall Raymond Davis, a U.S. Uh, well, a CIA contractor killed two Pakistanis in broad daylight, uh, January 28th, uh, 2011. Um, we, the United States government, President Obama, said all sorts of misleading things about who he was, that he was a State Department official, diplomatic cover, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it turned out he was a CIA contractor, which was pretty obvious because this was a guy who, you know, basically took out two people with two shots, uh, had, you know, was huge bulging muscles, uh, wasn't, you know, didn't look like a diplomat, um, and, uh, and of course, so that, that again confirmed a Pakistani conspiracy theory that their country is just a wash in CIA folks going around killing Pakistanis, and uh, so it, um, the relations were bad, and the, there was concerns that a U.S.-Pakistani operation, the, the details would leak. Another idea was to drop a, you know, to, to bomb the compound. Uh, when people looked at what it would take, it was a B-52 raid. Would, would, to destroy this compound would require 32 500-pound bombs. James Cartwright, who was President Obama's favorite general by Bob, Woods, Bob Woodward's description, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, pointed out that this would be like having an earthquake going off in a fairly large Pakistani city. You couldn't prove to yourself if you killed bin Laden, you'd be bombing an ally, there'd be civilian casualties. Uh, you know, if this was dismissed out of hand fairly quickly. Another idea which had certain, a number of adherents was to use a drone strike using a small experimental drone. No one would tell me what exactly that was, but I could tell from the way that people described it that this was not something that the U.S. Air Force uh, was using. And as I looked into it, it looked like something that Raytheon had developed, a nine-pound bomb. You know, the smallest bomb the U.S. Air Force drops is 500 pounds. So a nine-pound bomb, uh, it had never been used in combat before. Admiral Mike Mullen, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, was very skeptical of this idea, uh, using sort of relying on technology. The, dro the, the experimental drone had a number of advantages uh, as an idea. One, um, if you did the drone strike, whoever was in this compound wasn't going to complain about it. They were clearly trying to keep a very low profile. So it would probably be pretty deniable. Um, but there were also problems with, the, uh, with it. You couldn't pick up any intelligence with the drone strike uh, at the compound you uh, might miss the target. Uh, people survived drone strikes. Um, and uh, so there were, there were a number of people who thought it was a good idea, a number of people who didn't. There was, of course, the US Navy SEALs, uh, boots on the ground uh, idea. And there was also the very tempting human idea about let's just wait and see if we can get anything better about the intelligence before we make a decision. And let's just defer this decision as long as possible. But there were costs even in delay, because the longer you delay, more people are knowing about what's going on, or they know something's going on. So once you start operationalizing a military operation like SEALs on a, you know, a Navy SEAL operation, for, you have to have people practicing the operation. They practiced in North Carolina for a month in April. Then they had a much bigger rehearsal in Nevada, and more and more people are finding out about this. And you're, there are concerns about leaks, and in fact, you have to bring in people who are going to deal with the leaks. So Ben Rhodes was brought in because there were concerns. We, need, we, may, need, we may need to talk to newspaper editors to tell him or her, you know, why not to, you know, to, to hold this story. Uh, they brought in George Little, who was a, he's just been, the, uh, just stepped down as the head of public affairs at the Pentagon, who was the head of public affairs at CIA. Basically, we need also to think about, how, we need to think about how we explain this to America, the American people if it goes wrong. And so they produced a 66-page uh, unclassified version of the intelligence that they could explain to everybody uh, in the event that the operation didn't work. Anyway, so more and more people are finding out. There are five National Security Council meetings to discuss uh, the, the issue. The last, issue, the last uh, uh, meeting is on April the 28th, 2011. During the meeting, uh, President Obama goes around the table and asks people for their opinions. Some of you already knows the opinions of some. Uh, Bob Gates, the Defense Secretary, says basically I'm against uh, not only is this circumstantial evidence? And I've seen too many circumstances. He was, of course, the former director of the CIA himself. I've seen too many circumstantial cases fall apart. What happens if the Pakistanis close off our supply routes to Afghanistan, which uh, every, every 
know, 90% of at that time of the material going to US and NATO troops is transiting Pakistani airspace or Pakistani land. Um, and, uh, you know, and reminded everybody about the op Operation Desert, Desert One. Senator Joe Biden, who'd become a senator when President Obama was 13, also said that he was against uh, the raid uh, for all the reasons I've just outlined. And he was also concerned about an attack on the US Embassy in 1979. An enraged Pakistani mob had burnt the embassy to the ground, uh, concerned about that kind of reaction. Um, and of course, all you know, SEALs being, uh, there, there was a concern that you could have 24 Raymond Davises who were suddenly in Pakistani prisons or, or, pa or a firefight with the Pakistani military and civilian casualties. James Cartwright, uh, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, advocated for the experimental drone strike. On the other side of the issue, Admiral Mike Mullen had attended the final rehearsal in Nevada, uh, the full dress rehearsal where they flew in for an hour to the target uh, at night, did the raid, and flew out again for another hour. Uh, he was uh, in favor, he, he, he shaked every hand of the SEALs involved. He uh, had a great faith in Admiral McRaven. He was in favor of the raid. And that's unusual where the vice chairman and the chairman have two different, uh, essentially two different pieces of military advice for the president. Um, Liam Panetta was always in favor of the raid. And uh, Hillary Clinton, who of course was senator, uh, f uh, senator from New York on September 11th and visited Ground Zero on September 12th, gave a long and loyally exposition of both the pros and the cons of uh, everything that was being suggested and then came down on the raid as well. And so at seven o'clock the meeting is finished. President Obama goes back to his quarters at the White House and at 8.20 the following morning comes out and authorizes the mission, uh, tells Tom Donnell and Dennis McDonough uh, it's a go. Uh, we all know how it uh, turned out. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I was the only person uh, to get into the compound to get a look at it and it was useful to also reconstruct what happened the night of the raid because there's physical evidence you can see about what the SEALs did that night that I was able to see, uh, for instance, which, which doors they blew through uh, they had to blow through a huge 20-foot door on the ground floor to get to the second and third floor uh, where bin Laden lived. There was a, also a very large door on the third floor preventing in in entrance into bin Laden's bedroom. Uh, they didn't blow through that because bin Laden had sort of poked his head out and uh, was either confused or sort of in a hurry and, and didn't close it behind him. Bin Laden had 15 minutes to surrender. A helicopter had uh, crash-landed in his house, which is a pretty loud event. Uh, he had uh, told his wives, we now know, the Americans have arrived. So he knew that the jig was up. Uh, he, if he had conspicuously surrendered, it would have been a war crime to shoot him, uh, as it would be in any uh, US military operation. Uh, he didn't surrender. He had two guns in his room. He didn't reach for them. He may have been paralyzed by indecision, fear, uh, surprise, uh, who knows? Clearly, uh, he didn't expect this to happen. He didn't have a plan B. He didn't, uh, there was no safe, ha safe room in the house. Uh, there was no uh, tunnel out. The CIA was concerned there might be a tunnel out, but when they looked at the water table, it's very high in that part of the country, and there was no way there could be a tunnel. Uh, his, uh, he, you know, he may have been concerned about having a firefight in an enclosed space with uh, his wives and kids around him. Anyway, he, the point is he put up no resistance. And what was very interesting to me was his death was greeted by basically indifference in the, in the Muslim world. Um, you know, I think bin Laden by then had basically his his moment had sort of come and gone. His claim that Al Qaeda represents, uh, you know, is, is defending Muslims, I think, had been very largely undercut by Al Qaeda's activities in Iraq. Something he himself understood, uh, because this is a group that killed most, you know, literally tens of thousands of Muslim civilians uh, during the Iraq War uh, in suicide attacks, um, and he had become irrelevant now. Did, did that mean that it wasn't important to capture or kill him? Uh, of course not. For the victims of 9-11, their families, for the restoration of American national honor, I think these were all very important uh, uh, you know, to, fi to finally find him. And when, the, when it happened, I was on CNN and Wolf Blitzer asked me immediately after the president stopped talking, what's your reaction? And I obviously didn't have any time to rehearse this because I didn't know <laughs> that would be his question. I didn't even know that bin Laden was dead necessarily until the president confirmed it. And I said, you know, the war on terror is over. Uh, we can basically announce that. And, and by, what, by that, I didn't mean that terrorism was over, but I, mean, I meant the war on terror, capital W, capital T, is over. At the end of the day, if the Taliban had handed over bin Laden, we wouldn't have been in, in Afghanistan, and we wouldn't have been in Iraq, in my view. I mean, I think history would have been very different.
And you know, Bin Laden, 9-11 was his strategic idea. I believe in a very old-fashioned old view of history, which is you know, certain people change history. And it's very hard to explain why the French were at the gates of Moscow in 1812 without Napoleon and an understanding of his personality and ego. I think it's very hard to explain the Holocaust without Hitler. And I, I think it's impossible to explain 9-11 without Bin Laden because it was his strategic conception. And it was his, um, he had a very naive, naive idea about the United States is that we would, if we were subjected to enough violent pressure, that we would pull out of the Middle East. Uh, quite the reverse happened. Uh, he based that, on, and he told this to me when, I, when we interviewed him in 1997, you know, that the United States is a paper tiger and they're like the former Soviet Union. If you, if, you know, they will, you know, they fear death and we love, uh, you know, uh, we love death and, and these kinds of kind of sloganeerings. He, uh, he misunderstood completely uh, a, a light, what the American reaction would be to 9-11. To and we all thought of it at the time as uh, sort of like Pearl Harbor. Yes, it was very like Pearl Harbor. It was a great tactical victory for Al-Qaeda, which led ineluctably to their strategic defeat, just as Pearl Harbor was a great tactical victory for the Japanese, but within four years caused the collapse of Imperial Japan. Al-Qaeda means the base in Arabic. They lost the best base they ever had as a result of 9-11. I have Afghan friends who were watching 9-11 as it happened, and they were happy is the wrong word. They were cognizant of the fact that they could be liberated from the Taliban because of this attack. Uh, you know, if you do the thought experiment where there's no 9-11, there's no reason why the Taliban wouldn't be in control of Afghanistan today. So the whole thing was a strategic failure for bin Laden. And I think, you know, Al-Qaeda, the organization that attacked us on 9-11, is, is on life support, which, of course, doesn't mean that there won't be people inspired by bin Laden's message, as we saw in Boston. Uh, if you look at what Jahar Tassaniyev was scrawling in the boat just before he thought he was going to be killed, he basically was scrawling a version of Bin Laden's principal message, which was the United States, the West, led by the United States, is at war with Islam, and we need to kind of take revenge on the U.S. And that very simple message will have rev resonance with, you know, at least a very small minority of young men, because almost invariably they're young men, um, and Bin Laden's message will live on. Uh, but I think there are fewer and fewer takers uh, for the message. Al-Qaeda in Syria is certainly a, a big concern uh, because they seem to have learned from the mistakes that Al-Qaeda in Iraq had. Uh, but I think the long-term prognosis for, these, for, this, for this group and this ideology is pretty poor. So with that, I'll take any questions.